Okay, so our next uh, presenter will be uh, Sharif Rauf, and he's present presenting on peripapillary retinal perfusion and papilledema, a, a pilot study using OCT angiography, and he's a fourth year medical student from Stony Brook. All right, everybody, yeah, um, thank you very much for the introduction. This is our talk. Let's get right to it. Um, no disclosures to share with you all. All right, so um, OCTA, what are we talking about here? This is um, a uh, promising new optical imaging modality that uses motion contrast. Its fundamental premise is the same as OCT, um, except with the variation of how the data is processed by the software. Um, volumetric scans are acquired and segmented. Um, nice thing, and we'll hopefully get to this, is that you can acquire qualitative as well as quantitative data. Um, so the technology that distinguishes OCTA from OCT that we're all familiar with is called split spectrum amplitude decorrelation, um, or SSADA. Essentially, it allows um, the machinery to distinguish between static and non-static tissue due to the fact that non-static vessels will produce signals of larger or more varying amplitudes over time. Um, that is. Particles that move faster across the light beam will cause a higher decorrelation and can be distinguished in that way. The thought or the hope is that with this, um, you can distinguish perfused vessels which should be more highly decorrelated from more static tissue. So this is kind of what you get with an SSADA. You get an on-face angiogram. Um, the, the important point to take home here is that vessels must be perfused and kinetic in order to be seen. Um, it can be, it, thus it can be useful in uh, assessing the perfused retinal capillary network in the macula as well as retinal peripapillary capillaries. Um, so those we'll just call RPCs from now on, retinal peripapillary capillaries. A um, bit of the anatomy, um, depending on the depth of focus that you opt for, OCTA can image various um, vascular beds in the retina, including the uh, choriocapillaris, which is not depicted in this diagram. Um, until recently, the RPC network has been uh, mostly visualized through histopathology analysis ex vivo. Um, that's demonstrated here with this India ink preparation. Um, advanced optics scanning um, has also been able to capture the fine details of this capillary network um, but it can be somewhat uh, limited um, a recent study demonstrated did a comparison between OCTA and op adaptive optics um, we can talk about the relative strengths and weaknesses of those but um, the thinking is that OCTA will allow for better visualization of this network um, while perhaps be a little bit easier on the healthcare provider and the patient. Short description of the kind of data that we'll get. Um, so here, I'm going to show you, we're going to have a visual representation of areas that are well perfused, as well as areas of dropout. In terms of the quantitative data, which affords significant advantage, um, we'd like to get mean perfusion values um, for different segments surrounding the optic disc, as well as inside the disk. Uh, the analysis fundamentally begins with determining where the layer of interest is. This is just an example of the automated segmentation highlighting the NFL layer between the red and green lines. For a given image, um, you can then calculate what's called the mean uh, perfused vessel density. Um, Essentially, this is basically um, a calculation of the total number of voxels or pixels in, within a given sector um, that correspond to perfused anatomy divided by the total number of pixels in that anatomy. And then we can subset, uh, we can subsect each of the uh, areas that we're referring to and determine whether or not there's a spatial relationship, etc. So the basis for um, the sectors that you're seeing around these, and we'll refer to these throughout this, um, are the work that Garway Heath did in determining um, 
where uh, RNFL defects uh, and prominent bundles kind of converged on the optic disc. Um, so the parapapillary ring is thus divided into the six sectors um, that were the basis for their work. So that's OCTA. So this is a bit about the processing. Here on the leftmost, you see the image that we've viewed over and over. This is a skeletonized OCTA, which just takes every vessel that you'll see, regardless of its width, and assigns a uniform one unit width. Um, this allows for uh, better visualizations of areas of dropout and also prevents us from perhaps overestimating the effect of large vessels on the perfused vessel density calculation. And the last two maps are simply um, color maps where a color is assigned to each pixel in the frame based on the density in that area. Density of greater than 50% perfusion is assigned the color of red, zero is blue, and then intermediate colors are accordingly assigned. And then you can kind of see how um, illuminating that the uh, overlay of the two can be. Um, this is just a quick overview of some of the work that's already been done. A prominent paper showed that in normal disks, the dense um, microvascular network was visible with OCTA um, and that it was visibly attenuated in glaucomatous uh, eyes. So this is our fundamental question. Can this provide any uh, new information about parapapillary retinal perfusion in papilla demodus eyes? This is our purpose. We had two hypotheses that there was a difference between our patient and control groups and that patient eyes would have lower perfusion <coughs> of the RPCs. This is our methods, all done at the same place. Um, a bit about our control and patient numbers and their breakdowns. This is the equipment that was used. Um, and a bit about the analysis that we did. So uh, the parametricity of the data was examined. Um, there were some departures from it, but not enough to preclude us from using an ANOVA. And then a comparison was also performed between uh, low and high grade. It was not found to be statistically significant, but we'll limit our remarks to the former comparison. Again, this is just a bit of the qualitative. Here we have color mapped representations of control and low and high grade papilledema subjects. And so you can see even subjectively that there are increased air blue areas of non-perfusion in papilledematous subjects as compared to controls. Uh, these are the perfusion density values that we referred to earlier. You'll see that across the board, in each of the six sectors, as well as the entire parapapillary region taken together, there is significantly increased perfusion for controls. Um, the inside disc is notably the only one that is increased in patients versus controls, and we're going to get into why that might be the case. This is just a, an example of uh, control in a high grade. And so you see here that for these uh, comparison, high grade papilledema versus our controls, there was a statistically significant decrease in RPC perfusion. Um, and this is highlighting just some of the areas of dropout. So I guess the take home result, if there was really one to be taken home, is that there was an overall parapapillary decrease of 5.7% decrease in parapapillary perfusion between the papillodematous and control optic nerves. So just a bit about the pathophysiology. While this isn't completely elucidated, this very much informed the way we were thinking about our results and how we might um, interpret what was happening. Um, so the idea is that papilledema in increased intracranial pressure um, is not entirely uh, a vascular phenomenon. Hira has done a lot of work that's been really use useful on this. The pathogenesis is not one of initial leakage of fluid into the interstitial space, but rather um, it's thought to be caused by intrinsic swelling of the ganglion cell layer due to stasis of ax axoplasmic flow. The initial edema then can cause compression of low pressure venules um, and then venous stasis can give rise to um, 
leakage of venous blood into the extracellular space. The thinking is that low pressure venules and uh, parapapillary capillaries would be most subject to this kind of compression. So um, it's kind of easy to see how this might um, cause some kind of ischemic damage. As the RPCs become uh, progressively obstructed, um, the venous stasis could lead to hyperperfusion. Um, that, in turn, could lead to dilation of superficial capillaries at the nerve head. Um, and ischemia is possible. Ischemic damage to the RNFL is what we're worried about. And we're, we would be very remiss if we didn't think that this could be able to predict uh, RNFL bundle loss and visual field loss in papilledema. While we haven't correlated the deficit in perfusion density with that functional loss, that's something that we would aspire to do. Um, so there were lots of you know, limitations. This was the first time study that we'd done with OCTA. Um, there are lots of artifacts um, in acquiring the data, a lot of good data um, that we would have loved to keep had to be thrown out. We rely quite heavily on the automated segmentation. The machine doesn't always do that well, especially in highly edematous discs or very tilted discs. Um, we often had to manually adjust the delineation of where Brux membrane was opening. Um, um, and then, you know, we worry about vessels where um, perfusion hasn't ceased entirely, but it was very slow. And the concern is that the decorrelation algorithm may not be uh, robust enough to detect those as perfused. So it becomes a matter of thresholds, and that's something I think everybody's still trying to figure out. It's an example of a notable, pardon me, a notable uh, lousy image due to artifact. Um, again, like I mentioned, we didn't have any uh, basis to make structure function assessments. Um, and also, there's no normative database for us to work with while collecting the data. This is something I think that is going to be a really promising avenue for OCTA analysis. Um, and you know, we want to see whether changes, particularly in the perfusion of the RPC network, can be associated with bundle uh, loss and visual field testing, um, and whether or not that will be robust enough to be detected. So I think OCTA is really exciting. Um, the more I've gotten familiar with it, the more I'm kind of convinced of its potential. Uh, with a few caveats that we've discussed. I think it's, it's a very fast, non-invasive uh, way to image the capillary networks. Um, I think it's, once well used, could be exquisitely sensitive to identifying changes in perfusion levels um, and might elucidate um, some of the functional losses that we see in a disease like papilledema. Some references team that I'm indebted to, and I'll take any questions or comments. We'll have to talk about this more. Were all patients either dilated or undilated, and was the illumination in the room where the OCTA testing was done controlled in all patients? Yeah, the room was uh, dim, and patients were uh, not always dilated. The technician who did the scans didn't seem to think uh, that that mattered, but the room was always very dark. So some were dilated, some were not. No, they, they were not dilated. All were not. Yeah, dilated. yeah. Did you think they ought to have been, or? Well, just with coral capillary perfusion, I mean, you could definitely get changes in, you know, amount of blood perfusion with changes in, you know, lighting conditions and dilation status. So just one thing to control for. No, I don't think it matters as long as it's consistent. Okay. Yeah, I think it's consistent. Yes. In correlation to the chronicity of prosthodema, how long you have it, if you have more chronic changes, stasis changes after long standing prosthodema? So I, I think that might be a, a shortcoming of our analysis. You know, we, we didn't have very many um, of the high grade. I'm going to show you the qualitative comparison, um, but we didn't adjust for time of, uh, since diagnosis. I suppose that's uh, the best thing we could have done. We tried to do comparison by grades, I'm sure, but um, I think that would be interesting to pursue once our data set was uh, more robust or be more subjects 
with a long-standing diagnosis. How do you know um, that you're seeing reduced perfusion due to papilledema versus reduced ability to detect perfusion because of the papilledema itself obscuring vasculature? Um, I don't think that we do. Uh, we try and we are trying to address this. I think the skeletonized version of the OCTA analysis might address that. Um, so that was the picture where every vessel, regardless of its width, was assigned the same dimension. Um, and the same threshold was used to declare it as either perfused or not perfused. The thinking is that if you have compression of very small uh, vessels, but also the analogous dilation of medium or larger vessels in papilledema, that you might be overestimating the contribution from dilated vessels. So we were worried that that was going to obscure the compression of the vessels we were interested in. Um, beyond that, that's, that's a difficult question to address. And that was the way that we came up with um, to kind of alleviate that concern in our minds. But I think that's a question we're, we're struggling with. Thank you very much, Drew.